So I'm going to move over to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Thenmori Sundararajan from the USA. And uh, Thenmori is a filmmaker, is a transmedia artist and storyteller. And she is the Equality Labs director, which is an organization based in Oakland, California. And uh, Equality Labs has been uh, recently involved in the creation and curation of Dalit History Month. And uh, she hosts a podcast on cast in USA and has been on the uh, forefront of supporting the CIS recent Cisco case, a cast case uh, that, uh, that is coming up that has been going on there. So we are uh, very honored and privileged, and it is my distinguished honor to invite uh, Ms. Tenmori Sundararajan to please address the audience. Again, please, uh, we have a limitation of 10 minutes, so try to complete your message in the 10 minutes if you possibly can. Thank you so much. Over to you, Tenmori. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Satvalji, and really uh, an honor and a privilege to be here with so many global Ambedkarites around the world. And, you know, what I am so struck by is not only the power and the resilience of the Ambedkarite community in these very difficult times, but also the tremendous amount of love. And love is an Ambedkarite quality that I think is so important to remember in times as dark as today. And, you know, I'm sure like many of the other people on this call, um, we have been haunted by friends and family members who are struggling to get oxygen, struggling to get access to vaccines, of stories of dead bodies in the streets that are being dumped because the hospitals cannot take them and bodies on fire. And this is one of the most obvious um, examples of the crisis of Brahminical governance at its worst, that we would have leaders who would rather campaign while all people are dying in the streets. And so when we have such difficult moments like this, I think about how many um, examples exist of Dalit Bahujan um, and Ambedkarite resistance that has happened in other dark times um, that have really allowed for our collective power and intellect and knowledge and fortitude to really bring our people past this crisis. And I think about Savitri Bhai Pule, who actually, you know, created clinics for um, uh, the pandemic, um, the flu pandemic in, in the early 1900s, and how she died ministering for care for our people. I think about the many Dalit Bahujan doctors that are on the front lines even today. You know, many of, you know, and I have, you know, family members who are part of COVID response in, um, in Karnataka and in Tamil Nadu. And the stories that they have and the things that they have seen are unmentionable. And at this time, we need to be able to take the lessons of Ambedkar and his towering legacy and put it into critical action today, because we have seen the challenges of what happens out of Brahminical governance. And now, um, you know, Bahujan communities need to become aligned to not just solve the problems for our community, but see ourselves as the creators of the institutions that are required to free India um, out of this crisis. And I think so many of the solutions that people spoke about today are very critical. We need to be innovating in terms of the sectors of education and innovation. We need to be demanding investments so that, you know, we cannot allow a government that has sentenced our people to death in this way to be responsible for the solutions when they have shown no care, no, no consideration to the level of, um, uh, of damage and violence that has occurred. And we know that Ambedkarites are mobilizing for amazing solutions. So for example, we know that Naglok is working with the SSD and multiple other Bahujan organizations like Ambedkar Association of North America to be able to create a makeshift hospital so that our people would have care from our communities and they will not be abandoned at this time. Um, so I think thinking about how we might not only participate through funding and mutual aid, but also in vision, because I think fundamentally that is one of the most powerful things that Ambedkar's legacy really gives to us. Ambedkar never stopped at the um, rapid response solution. Ambedkar thought about how can we be the architects 
of the future. And whether it was his vision as an economist or as a, um, um, uh, a, an advocate or as the architect of the Indian constitution, he was always thinking about the fact that we need to drive the future of the country, not simply be the recipients of policies that come from brahminical failures that you know, continue to hoard wealth for the few um, at the expense of the many. And at this moment, particularly since we have so many powerful global embed credits here, we must you know, increase the flow of investment to possibilities in India at this time Time, we must aggressively lobby so that we can end the vaccine apartheid that is leading to the shortage of medicines and supplies that um, are leaving people crowdsourcing and begging for oxygen and beds at a time when India actually gave all of those things away <laughs> in a short-sighted policy. Um, but most importantly, we must continue to also practice um, the Buddhist uh, frameworks that allow us to be free from Brahminism. And, you know, as someone who was born in the diaspora, I, I really came to Buddhism, you know, um, in, in a very, like, very powerful way through other um, people who are practicing socially engaged Buddhists. And the thing that was so compelling to me about that was that, you know, when we talk about suffering, the Buddha was not talking about suffering in some existential far away aspect. He was talking about it in the context of social inequity, about what he saw from the violence of Brahminism. And if we are to practice non-attachment, if we are to practice um, our politics that come from uh, the liberation that really is um, our goal in terms of the freedom for suffering, we must look at as our battle for justice as one that is equated to the suffering of all humans. And we must also think ambitiously about the ways that we solve for those problems. And we have faced many things, I think, um, as an embed correct community. At the time that we are reaching global um, uh, recognition, we also see very difficult Brahminical um, battles that, um, you know, that see their, their challenging of our assertions everywhere. So in the context of the Cisco case, even now, this week, we will be having a very powerful hearing to ask the, the county of Santa Clara, which is where all of these tech companies are based, um, to add caste as a protected category. And as we have, um, you know, hundreds of organizations sign up to be able to support our people's pursuit for civil rights, we are seeing brahminical attempts to divert the issue, shut down the, um, the conversation. And again, even in those moments, we can always go back to Ambedkar's legacy, because was he not gaslit? When Gandhi, you know, did his fast and, you know, forced the Pune Pact, we always see that there are attempts to divert revolution into reform that makes it easier for Savarna fragility to not acknowledge the tremendous violence that they have um, that they have enacted on our people and the enormous um, uh, capital and labor and emotional suffering that they've, they've put our people through. But that is why when we are united, when we are grounded in our practical realities, when we practice mindfulness that lets us go beyond um, superstition and the irrationality of Brahminism, and we come forth as a people united by justice and love and equity, we are an unstoppable force. And that is true that for us, you know, we cannot simply celebrate Ambedkar in our closed doors we must actually take Ambedkar's car garva everywhere that we can, whether that's in parliament, whether that's in our institutions and workplaces, whether it's in our universities, whether it's in our personal networks and relationships, everywhere that we carry the banner of justice, people must know that Ambedkarites stand for the freedom of all people. And when we do that, when we honor Ambedkar's legacy in that way, in a similar way, we're also honoring the mission of the Buddha. And I always love that story where, you know, there's this image of the Buddha holding open the door for all that could come past before he goes on to his next um, journey. And that is what our responsibility is, that, you know, while there are any of our people who are suffering, who are in the darkness of Brahmanism, it is our responsibility to hold the light of this truth, of the Dhamma.
And that really requires us to really think about how we heal ourselves internally, think about our relations interpersonally, and impact the structural. And so our conduct, um, our political processes, and the way that we build systems in society are the only way forward. And so I think as an embed diaspora, we have an economic responsibility to invest ambitiously, to be part of transnational efforts that can change society at its whole by the companies and collaborations that we build. And also we must assert that it is time for a society that is rooted in love and empathy and Dhamma. And so in many ways, like however we find ourselves, whether we're working collaboratively in this space or people are working on their own initiatives, um, I just want to really, you know, end with this commitment to a path of love, because so much of the pain and the grief that we've experienced, as well as the polarization and violence as the, the terrible policies of this Brahminical authoritarianism is, you know, unleashing in our homelands, the only response to that to love is love. And every embed crite that is here is an artifact of centuries of embed crite love because our families have nurtured us, loved us, cared for us through tremendous violence to bring us here. And now we must in turn love those that come after us by being bastions of liberty and justice because by holding a different opportunity of the future, we can turn the tide. Embed crime movements can turn the tide of this darkness if we are united in power and vision and empathy. And that is embed cars fundamental um, legacy that he has given us is the courage to be able to do so, the, the architecture and the blueprints from which we can mine our policies to be able to do that, and the call for unity at a time of such deep division. So in that spirit, I really want to bring, you know, the, the, the messages of solidarity and love and care from our base at Equality Labs. Um, we are here and we are with every embed crite that is standing for power and justice today. And we will do all that we can to stop the violence um, for our people, but also to think of radical embed crite futures. So it's an honor to be here and, you know, so excited to be part of this conversation. And Jay Beam and Jay Savitri for everyone. Thank you so much, Jonathan Murray. That is absolutely a far powerful message that you have given. And uh, the whole idea was to bring everyone together, as I said at the outset at the beginning, and perhaps uh, this is a conversation, and uh, it's time has come to reach out, uh, at least uh, uh, those who are living in the USA, uh, UK, Europe, outside India, to see if you can come together and uh, with some new a vision uh, that perhaps we can inspire people who are actually in India. Uh, maybe we can take some powerful steps from outside and inspire the people of India. And, uh, and thank you very much for doing that great work with Equality Labs in conf confronting caste discrimination in the USA. And uh, you are absolutely right. Every time we confront caste, we see the Brahminical lobby I try to step sabotage us. I try to put all sorts of obstacles in our way. And you know very well, we also experience that uh, in the United Kingdom. And one thing I can share with you that every time an Ambedkarite stands up, it sends the, the fascists, the obscurantists running into a corner, especially when they see the level of Ambedkar, that these people are Ambedkarites. These are Ambedkarians who are fighting for equality and justice. And it does scare them. It frightens them. And that is the power of, the, of Ambedkar. 